finding auto encoders and <laughs> okay learning how to train oh the, this is the player evaluate and tune I okay <laughs> you start on your own yeah yeah i yeah, start <laughs> AI, AI doing this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Hello, hello. We are going to explain autoencoders. So we are start defining what is autoencoder, what the concepts, and or some of its applications. We also going to explain how to train, evaluate, and tune on the complete auto uh, autoencoders with HO2. Also, we are going to explain how to autoencode this to find our layers in our observations. And we are going to explain how to train and evaluate the denoting autoencoders using the same framework and explain how to train and evaluate to express autoencoders with AO2 and list some other popular autoencoders because there are many in classification. This is a really long topic. So when we talk about autoencoders, we are talking about neural networks. And they are trying to reproduce the most frequently observation characteristics. So it's like a summary. And return effective summaries like on numeric and that's it. And the output is over the same number of neurons to the inputs. So I have one co five columns, the last a layer of the neural network would be five, five neurons. So it comes, it have two parts, the encoder function. So it takes our inputs and, and use the encoder to translate it to another form. And then we use the decoder to take it back to the original form. And, and that's what they do. And they measure how well they do using maybe the MSE as a measure of error. So the point is that uh, we hope that the inputs and the outputs be the same. If the model, after making this information, can keep the same values, we know that he really encode in a different way right here. The the inputs, and that's the main goal. So we can use autoencoders for dimensional reduction. That's maybe the most important application for this chapter. Also, we can use for anomaly detections based on the reconstruction error as a, as the anomaly score, as we were having mentioning. Also, we can use it for noise reduction. So what they do is to apply random noise to the inputs and then uh, use the original data to evaluate the reconstruction effort and try how that the model can generalize uh, the problem and can you know fit the problems that we have been facing. Also, is used for, re for information retrieval. That is essential of searching information. So in that concept, they can be used to compress websites. Uh, they can also generate tags, sneakers, and description for websites, identify keywords and important concepts within the context of websites. So basically, it's really useful to compress and understand information, even for test data. So it's a really powerful model. And also we can use for generative. So based on some constraint of the output, what are the inputs? And the, the point in this case is the decoder. They use the decoder, so you have some inputs and other are random, and then the decoder will generate the output. And you know, that's really important in the case of, in the era of ChatGPT, that's maybe, uh, the processor, you know, to those model. And they were used also to, to create new things based on the decoder. For this charter, we are going to use this package, deploy, ggplot2, 
and AOS2. That's all that we need. And we also use this data, the MS NIST, that I have some hand write numbers. So let's talk about on the complete autoencoders. As the goal is to create a reduced set of codings that identically represent the ads, the inputs, the number of neurons is less than the number of, of inputs, which helps to capture the most dominant features and signals of the data. So basically that we are trying to, to make the same thing to the PCA, but PCA have some limitations. When we don't apply any special transformation function, uh, the result of this process is really similar to the PCA. But with the with autoencoder, we also can find nonlinear active nonlinear relationships. In this book, there are many, many functions, and we are just going to use the tag. So it creates an S. And that's the transformation that happens in every neuron. We can see how, in comparison to PCA, how well it can separate the groups now. You can really take a cycle and, and separate easily the groups. That's not possible here or all together. So yeah, it's really powerful to, to create groups. And also it's important to know that the dimensions created by the this method not necessarily are perpendicular. So some of them could be correlated. And let's do it. So we are going to take the data from the train, then image, and we are going to store as features. And then we are going to call this function deep learning. The first a argument is the index of the predictors. So if you take this function, what it gives you is a sequence of number for each column. That's basically from one to 700 something <laughs> it, it are the columns that they, we are encoding. And then we use the training frame with the uh, giving the, the data frame that we're going to predict we need to set to autoencoder because this function also can train different types of, of, of neural networks, not just autoencoder. So we need to take in consideration this. And for this first example, we are just to have one layer with two codings. The, the task function that we mentioned before, and we are going to use spares because 80% of the elements in this data are zeros. So we can speed the computation with this parameter. So it's not maybe mandatory, but that will help if you have a lot of zeros in your data. And then we can use the deep features to select uh, to select the middle layer. I think, oh, it, it isn't display here. Maybe I can, oh, let me just draw it. And let me go back to go up. The representation of this neural network is really simple. It's like we have, and let me try to draw. Yeah. So we have the inputs. Let's say input one, input two, input three. Then in the middle, we will have another neuron another layer. So we will have two, two, two layers. And then we have the same number of outputs. So we start with three. And they, they have a, a massive relation. It's like a, or are connected to all. So I have the connection from yeah, just two, one, just two. And the same for the output. Uh, 
And that's the simple model that we are training. So when you saw that we just put two, we were talking about this hidden layer. We say it's hidden because it's between the input and the output. And yes, we just have one layer with two call with two nodes. Uh, let me check how it all drops. Great. Let's continue. Just to clarify what, what we're, they, we're doing here. And when they select layer one, yes, they are selecting the the layer in the middle. The only one that so in the output of both narrow it is two columns for every row. And maybe and that's the the model that summarize all the columns in just two columns. Uh, different to PCA, we don't have a, a standard deviation to describe how much of the variation it, these two layers represent. But we can see to the MSC, MSE to, to know how well, how well the quality of the translation. Uh, and we will see how we can answer to that evaluation, but they don't they don't give that in, in at this point. But we are not constrained to have just one layer. We can have more. And we have uh, the stack encoders. So we have multiple hidden layers. They need to be symmetrical. So we can have, for example, one layer of 100 codings or we can have this part then to start out. This is the inputs, and then we down to 300, then we go to 100 units, and then go back again. Or we can have five hidden layers. So yeah, and that's something that we need to tune. <laughs> so we start over, and we we create our, our grid. So, okay, let's have one layer with 50 codings, one layer with 100 codings, or just maybe a three layers with, with the distribution or maybe even five layers. And then we take that to the H2 grid. So we need to, to select the algorithm as a deep learning and then we pass all the same uh, part arguments that we passed before. So we just need to select a seed. And also the, the grid that we want to, to train. Then we can use get grid with, uh, with the name that we give it here, the grid ID with the grid ID we defined before, and we select based on the MSC. And we can see that the best one is just a simple, uh, just one, one layer with 100 codings. That's the best representation. And we can get that model using the syntax, the grid, then select model ID and just pick the first one. And then just with that, we just get the, the ID and with the ID, we can select the model. Uh, and here we have the best model. And we can use these functions to also see, uh, based on the data, how was the original representation and what is the new one. So just imagine we are, this result is just with 100 columns and we were using 750. So yeah, and we still can see the numbers, zero, five, zero, and four. So yeah, to me, it looks good. <laughs> now we also can use the same model to find a, Anomal, uh, anomaly detection. So we want to see weird observations. And what we need to do, we need to get the reconstruction error for for this for each feature. 
for each observation. So use the anomaly. Anomaly. We get the we use the model and then select the, the data frame. And then it will return the the reconstruction error for each observation. Then we can explore the distribution because what is normal is relative to the to the population. So we can create histogram, maybe a bus plot. And what we are trying to find is outliers. And we can see we have a right skew histogram. So yeah, there are real observation in this data. So what we they recommend is to retrain the model just taking the 75 percentile as the boss plot do and use it that no, as we see normal data maybe or best represent data, we can then select the most weird observations. So the ones that have the, the highest uh, reconstruction error with the new model here. And we can see uh, what were the 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 worlds the, the 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 observation with the worst error. And yeah, and they went they was a um, very good number of representations. So yeah, basically the undercoders uh, they select less hide them less coding for each layer. And we can tune how many layers uh, is there for our model. Uh, now we have the Denosi autoencoders. We train the autoencoders to reconstruct the original input from a corrupted copy of F, which forces the coding to learn more robust features even when the number of coding is greater than the number of inputs. So in for this particular case, we don't need to select fewer, fewer hidden layers. They, they can be even more. But the key point is that we need to add noise. It's like, okay, I have this digit, but let me add a little bit of noise. And then we use the, the neural network to, to fix that problem. And that's a really good way to, to get the main insight from our data set, not just from image processing. So to co to corruption process, we randomly set some of the inputs, uh, as many or as half of them, to zero or one. For continuous variable input, we can add a uh, Gaussian noise also. And here, maybe the most different part of this training is that we need to take the corrupted feature to the train frame and add a new variable, the validation frame as the original features. That, that's the only thing that you need to, to do to train this kind of, of models. Then they select the, the hidden layers to just have one. With 100, they keep as the best model before, and they they get the performance. So yeah, they can see here how was the the mean square error for 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 this model, and it was yeah, it will be good. It not was so high. Now we have the spurs and the colors. If we in the latest one, we want to see the more general patterns. Here, we want to see the more weird ones. So it's like the opposite. We want to see the opposite case. How we can do this? Uh, the, what they do is to, they take out the, the most influential uh, picture representation. So, Here we see some examples. We have the original, 
Uh, we have the autoencoder, we have the sparsity, and with the sparsity. So yeah, for example, in the file, I can see that uh, they even stem the curve of this file, of this weird file, you know? How we can do this? We need to first uh, get the sparsity measure. That is just the average of the active or inactive neurons. So we see, we see, we say that we have an active neuron when they is closer to one, and inactive when it's closer to minus one. So basically, what they do is to take the average, and that's why that's the code to do it. So they took the hidden layer, as we did before. Uh, take us a data frame, gather the inputs, and just get the mean. And that's it. That's the average activation. Really close to zero, but a little bit lower. Then, then use the Curva Libler uh, Debench. So it's this we formula. And they apply it to the minimum, uh, to the error function. So it's like a penalization. Adding the sparsity can force the model to represent each input as a combination of a smaller number of activation. So what they try to do is to activate less neurons if they are not needed. And we add the, the beta argument that we also need to tune in this case. So we create a grid with the beta parameters, and then we use H2 grid with the same parameters before. Also, we need to create a new ID and pass the grid uh, to this of this function. And we can select the best model. In this case, this, the best sparsity was 0 0.01 with with this error when we have uh, when we have we can we can select them and we get we will get this resource and yeah and more examples of autoencoders is the variation autoencoders are from genetic autoencoders, which means that they can be used to create new instances that closely resemble the input data, but are completely generated from the coding distri uh, distribution. Also, we have adversarial autoencoders. So they train two network, uh, networks, a uh, generated network to to reconstruct the input similar to the re regular decoders and then a discriminator network to compute where the inputs align on a probabilistic distribution and improve the generator. So what they do is that, okay, we are going to, uh, it like we are going to train a, uh, one model and also improve it with other models. So with the discriminator, it's like rather than uh, put, uh, using a person maybe to to make that discrimination, uh, they use another neural network. Also, we have the contrastive of the encoders, similar to the nosing of the encoders, constrain the the derivative of the hidden layers activation to be small uh, with a respect uh, with respect of the inputs. So they like they define a I don't know that's another one. This is the, the wind taker of encoders. So in this case um, the noise. 
I, I don't remember this one yet, but whatever. In this case, <laughs> they just select one percent of activation and they just pick the the most active neurons. So they are restricting also how many have ions. It's another way uh, related to the penalization. And also we have the stack convolutional autoencoders are designed to reconstruct visual features uh, processed through the convolutional layers without transforming to image vertical that is really efficient uh, for image processing. So yeah, I don't know you have something to add. But yeah, I really like the this topic and I really like the the under complete uh, autoencoders. I think that it's a really reliable way to to reduce our data and also to get insights. Uh, Angel, one comment that I have is that if it, if it was not of by for you know because of H two O library. Uh, because most of this development has been occurring not in R, but in in in, in other languages, you know, in Python and Go and all, the, all those languages. But uh, at least you know we have the H two O library that give us some a glimpse of what you know deep learning uh, is, is all about. Uh, so that's you know that 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 that's a good thing because uh, you know sometimes we need to. Uh, uh, you know, to include this type of uh, framework into our, you know, our mix of uh, of uh, different models. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, usually for tabular data, uh, usually deep learning is not the, you know, the the the, the king of the hill, right? Uh, usually in tabular data. Um, we go more with gradient boosting, with uh, you know, with uh, stack ensembles and all that. Uh, but for imaging, um, for text processing, uh, deep learning is really the the way to go. Yeah, we do. yeah. Uh, um, um, we have seen it with uh with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is based on this. Okay, these are the building blocks of of, of ChatGPT and or you know, other inter iterations. So at least for image. Like the the example that you uh, brought, the the MNIST example of numbers, and also imaging, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, is 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 the tool that really you know give us more, uh, you know, more more accuracy, um, a more a, a more optimization in that sense. All right. Yeah. No, no. Yes. Yeah, so I think that this kind of autoencoder approach is, is what is the good about is uh, just conceptually because I'm not I just uh, thank you for your explaining the details about the autoencoders but the thing is for me in my case my uh, like uh, researchers in urban planning or something maybe this is gonna be kind of a helpful to recognize about the based on the, these kind of uh, maybe shape or color recognitions, maybe computer visioning process to recognize the where is the natural area and then where is the building block building area. That kind of a computer visioning approaches is uh, quite helpful in my, maybe at least in my urban planning area to recognize about the, depending on the, those kind of a proportional proportion of the streetscape can be affected to the quality of life or maybe physical activity level in that neighborhood kind of things. Those kind of thing is uh, one of the emerging topic in my area to using the this kind of a deep learning process. But still, what is the good thing about autoencoder is uh, unlike uh, the other maybe computer vision techniques, this one actually tried to uh, try to reducing the reducing the num uh reducing the code. It is also kind of a, like a PCA. This is also kind of a demand uh demand reduction reduction technique to by compressing the compressing the all of the these kind of a raw input low input data as a, some set of the coding algorithm 
by using that coding coders, we can actually recognize about the, some of the shape more effectively. That actually computationally more effective, I think. So that's what I think. Because uh, those kind of uh, uh, dimension reduction techniques actually use for the how we can recognize the some of the images or text text file uh, by using the more uh, less less kind of uh, uh, features in in the in the, our coding. So less features actually allows us to programming the this kind of algorithm more effectively. So those are the kind of a process and techniques it is very helpful for us to think about. So yes and I also like that this this doesn't have any constraint, doesn't have any mm -hmm. uh, assumptions. Mm -hmm. So basically it, it works for you, it will work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because right now in here, actually in example in this in this chapter, the example of the, this chapter actually more care about the shape of the numbers, but but in the urban planning field or recently about the some of the neural network algorithm also cares about the color, and then uh, that actually adding the another complicated dimensions. Of the of the things like uh, other than the shape, we also need to recognize about the color like RGB or CMYK color level, and then uh, based on the that color level, maybe that color level allows us to the recognize the what is the in my case like like a, when we looking at the built environment, maybe this kind of algorithm automatically recognize about the this is the tree. And this is the green area. This is the kind of a pedestrian on the street or cars or truck, et cetera. So in, in that case, actually complication is very, very intensive, but this kind of auto encoder process is gonna be reduce the dimension of the, those things, which allows us to, to save our time to recognize the, all of the, these complicated text and imaging process. So that's what I thought, and then that's the what all encoder is really good about, like a dimension reducing, and then by using the dead coder, coders to understand the, some shape or colors of the text and images. Right, I think I will end. Yep, hold on.